submit these by typing them into the questions pane of the webinar control panel on your screen. You can send in your questions at any time during the webinar when they occur to you. We'll collect these all in and address as many of them as we can during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Philip Beale. Philip was an officer in the Royal Navy before embarking on a successful city career. In 2003, he left to pursue his ambition to reconstruct the 8th century Indonesian vessel known as the Borobudur ship. Philip sailed the Borobudur 12,000 miles across the Indian Ocean from Jakarta to Madagascar and around the Cape of Good Hope to Ghana in order to draw attention to Asian cultural influence on Africa. He was awarded Indonesia's highest state honour in 2004 by President Megawati in recognition of his accomplishments in inspiring the creation of the Borobudur ship and leading the expedition. In 2005, he conceived the idea of recreating the first circumnavigation of Africa by Phoenician mariners in circa 600 BC, as recorded by Greek historian Herodotus. In 2008 to 2010, Philip's custom uh, replica Phoenician ship, the Phoenicia, achieved the same, resulting in arguably the longest voyage of a replica ancient ship in modern history. In 2019, Philip set out to prove that the Phoenicians could have sailed across the Atlantic 2,000 years before Christopher Columbus. The Phoenicians before Columbus expedition sailed from Carthage, Tunisia to the Dominican Republic and then on to Florida. Tonight, Philip will tell the story of how the Phoenicia was built, the theory behind the possibility that the Phoenicians reached the New World before Columbus, and what happened during the voyage in 2019-20. So, Philip, it's over to you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope, hopefully, you can hear me. Yes, we can. Brilliant. That's really kind. Thank you very much, Mark, for that uh, really um, glowing uh, sort of biography there. Thank you. Um, I didn't realise I'd sort of done all of that. It sort of, you know, it sort of goes into the the back of the memory. It's done all these these things. But it's an honour for me to be able to talk to um, the, your audience tonight. Um, and I'm sure many of you will know a lot more about. Uh, you know the, the subject of uh, the Phoenicians and what was going on in the, uh, the Mediterranean in the ancient world but uh, bear with me and I hope you'll enjoy what I've got to say. As uh, Mark said I'm going to cover the, the presentation in three parts. I'll look to begin with at the research and how the ship the Phoenicia was built. Then I'll look at uh, why I believe um, the Phoenicians may well have made voyages across the Atlantic uh, to the New World. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the voyage that we undertook in 2019 to 2020. So that's my agenda. And just uh, to start then, I will um, just going to start with uh, just a quick sort of uh, update, if you like, on exactly who were the Phoenicians. I'm sure many of you will know who they are, but to, just to bring you all up to speed, the Phoenicians were really the remnants, if you like, or the remainders of the Canaanites that lived in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, modern day, um, modern day Palestine or, or Israel, Lebanon and Syria. And they were really a collection of city-states like Tyre, um, Sidon, Byblos, Tripoli, and, and Arvad in uh, modern-day uh, Syria. Um, and they were known for their incredible sailing skills and trading skills. And around sort of seventh, eighth century, a group of Phoenicians from Tyre and the legend has it that uh, the king of Tyre's daughter, Dido, left with seven or eight sea captains and first went to Cyprus and then founded Carthage in modern day Tunisia. And that became the focal point for the Phoenician or Carthaginian activity in the Western Mediterranean. And you can see on this chart, the 
the darker purple areas are where the Phoenician influence was, was strongest. And they were an incredible civilization. They traded on three continents. They were the, um, the first global traders. Uh, if you're drinking a glass of wine at home tonight, you know, we can thank the Phoenicians for uh, introducing wine into Europe and olive oil. They invented glass making. The modern alphabet that we use is derived from the Phoenicians. Um, and uh, they developed, as you'll see in a minute, incredible um, developments in seafaring and navigation. So they were quite uh, an incredible civilization and very much uh, underrepresented in history. And that's one of the reasons why I became interested because nobody else had really looked at the Phoenicians in the way that I wanted to. So um, that's just a little bit of background for you. And if I um, start here, um, basically uh, when I sort of dreamt up this idea of building a Phoenician ship in 2005, the big problem was that there were no uh, or, or very few examples of Phoenician wrecks that could be used. I mean, I wanted to look at a, a Phoenician galley rather than a warship, and uh, it uh, took quite a while to identify a suitable wreck. But eventually, um, I came across this um, wreck with the help, in, indeed, um, the late Honor Frost helped me locate um, a, a gentleman called Professor Pomme in, in France, in, in Paris. He, he was responsible for um, the excavation of two Phoenician or Aegean uh, vessels uh, from the sixth century, one called the Jules Verne 7, one called Jules Verne 9. And he gave um, me and my team access to uh, study the vessels so that we could build a scaled up replica of the, the Jules Verne 7. And so on this, slide that you're seeing now that's the the work of the uh, naval architect who took the information from the wreck and with a peer group um, helped design this vessel and uh, you can see at the bottom left here the first uh, keel the uh, stem and, uh, and uh, stern post being put in and the first few planks and uh, of the vessel so it took about two and a half years to do the research but by the autumn of 2007 we were able to start building the vessel and i was um, fortunate enough that i found on this little island called arwad in uh, syria just off the coast of Tartus, about, I guess, 100 or so miles east of Cyprus, but on the Syrian coast, just above uh, Beirut, uh, a group of wooden boat builders, and they were keen to build the boat. And um, so I appointed them to, to build the boat. And, and they started, as I say, um, in, uh, in the autumn of 2007. And on this next slide, you can see the keel has been laid and the first pegs have been inserted in order to put the first planks um, in it. And we've here we're using um, Aleppo pine, a, a sort of close cousin to uh, Lebanese cedar. So quite a, a hard wood and quite resistant uh, to, to rot and, uh, and water. Um, this next slide shows the first um, seven or so planks that have uh, been added to the keel. And you can see here uh, where my cursor is. I don't know where that's showing up, but um, the, here you've got the dowels. And these dowels are locking in pegs that, that are placed between the planks. And if you look at the very top of the the top plank you can see there are some holes there for the next peg to go in and then holes are drilled into that uh, those pegs so that it takes the dowels and the uh, the dowels are then locked in place 
and when um, the planks go into the water um, they swell up and um, these pegs hold the planks together in a very tight way so one of the construction uh, benefits of this is that the um, very little corking is actually ne needed because the, the planks are fitted together so well and they are forced together um, as, as the planks expand in the water so and this is the sort of mortise and tenon um, approach and this is what the the romans called the phoenician joint and it's really i believe the key to the phoenician success up until this point in history um, boat construction was was largely sewn so the the planks were sewn together and they were then very flexible and the materials used meant they were prone uh, to considerable leakage and uh, were very uh, really quite unsafe but the phoenicians with this mortise and tenon uh, joints created the first uh, robust hull and this enabled them to trade uh, more securely to go out in um, more difficult uh, sea conditions and uh, this led to a huge number of uh, advances in seamanship and here uh, in this next slide you can see the whole of the hull has been built with only a few uh, floor ribs being placed in it now this is the ancient way of building a ship um, if you can imagine um, a, a you know a log canoe for example could only take a small amount of cargo so as time went by the cargoes got bigger they added more planks and then they added the ribs later so in terms of how they built these boats they always built the the plank construction first so we call this plank first construction and the ribs are put in afterwards but you can almost you know deduce from this that these uh, hulls are already quite strong even before they put the ribs in and we had to teach um, our Syrian friends and boat builders how to do this uh, when we first talked to them they said um, that they built the ships in the Phoenician way and uh, we said well no you build the, the boats in a traditional way with the skeleton first and then you put the planks on afterwards the Phoenicians did it the other way around and to begin with they didn't believe us and uh, we you know they said well how do you know this and we said well archaeologists can show that this is the way they they did it and uh, eventually they believed us and said no it's fine we can we can do that and they learned very quickly and were able to build this boat in the ancient way um, and then when they got to this stage they then started putting in the ribs which you can see here so uh, and there are three types of ribs that are going in here we've got the floor ribs we've got the half ribs that create the the railings for the for the ship on the deck and then there are intermediary ribs that stretch from the floor up the side of the hull so it's quite a complex um, uh, issue and uh, there's lots of detail that goes into this including you can see the little marks on the sides of these ribs um, and i can i can explain that later but uh, it's uh, yeah quite a complex design uh, one thing i should mention is the phoenicians were one of the first uh, peoples to use iron nails they didn't use a lot of iron nails but they were at the beginning of the, the Iron Age and they drove in sometimes quite long iron nails up to 10 inches long from the outside through the planks and into the ribs to give extra strength and um, that was one of the additional uh, features that made these hulls incredibly strong and able to withstand uh, the rigours of the, the Mediterranean and, and beyond and this is uh, Phoenicia uh, as she was finished um, the first time she was in the water 
there's quite a lot of celebrations and we're in the harbour at uh, Arwad and the view here is just looking across to Tartus and the Syrian mainland and then um, we had some extra things to, to do in terms of adding a, a cabin and the like for the crew but um, what you see there is, is an beautifully designed boat um, that is both sort of longitudinally it's 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 convex um, but the the um, the timbers going across the deck were actually uh, much more uh, concave and uh, so just to bring you up to date it took about seven to eight months to build the whole ship in including setting the mast, getting the sails made, getting all the rope work done, uh, which was actually um, pretty quick. Uh, it was only delayed by uh, some shortages of timbers uh, that were hard to, to get because of restrictions on, on what we could get. But we made it in the ancient way and we only used timbers that were available in the ancient uh, times. So things like Mediterranean oak, um, the Aleppo pine I mentioned, all the pegs were made of, uh, of olive wood, which was the hardest wood available in the ancient times. So that just gives you a little bit of flavour there. And the next, I'm just going to show a very quick clip so you can see what she was like when she was first uh, uh, sailed. Okay, hopefully that just gave you a, a feeling for, for her. The box that you might have seen on the right hand side or on the, the port side of uh, Phoenicia was our Arabic toilet, our heads. Um, that was sort of fully automatic uh, and voted by the crew as the best way to have a toilet rather than having something on board that we had to, to clean. So. Um, that was that little bit. Um, so I next, um, just wanted to talk a little bit then about the theory as to whether the Phoenicians could have reached the Americas. Um, I've just got a map here, uh, Ptolemy's map that was available to Columbus, had been, you know, in Columbus's time, relatively recently published um, in the European printing presses at that time. And uh, this is, if you like, was the sort of the known world from China in the east to the Atlantic seaboard, or at least what people thought was the known world, or some people thought was the known world. Um, what I just wanted to sort of reflect on a little bit is um, we have, uh, you know, some incredible um, academics and writers that uh, some some Phoenician, some not. Um, but you have people like Aristotle. Uh, he was the first uh, person to scientifically prove that the world was round. And in fact, all of these gentlemen knew that the world was round. And this this idea that 
you know, the ancients thought the world was flat and there was a danger um, that they could fall off it was not universally shared. There was a, a, a Persian belief that the world was a disk, um, but a lot of the academics um, knew that the world was round. And uh, I just want to mention a couple of things here that uh, was, is interesting. Um, Eratosthenes, uh, who was the chief librarian at uh, Alexandria, uh, he calculated, was the first really to calculate the circumference uh, of the world. And he did it with a, an ingenious experiment that he conducted in, in Egypt. And he got within 3% uh, of the actual distance. So he, he calculated it to about 24,000 miles and it was 24,900. But then a, a strange thing sort of happened in the world that uh, Ptolemy and uh, Marinus of Tyre, they came along and recalculated uh, the distances for the circumference of the world and reduced it to about 18,000 miles. And worse was to happen in the sense of with Columbus, he then said he had corrected Marinus of Tyre's calculations because he said Marinus of Tyre had not allowed for the islands and lands beyond China and therefore he extended the world or the, the known world even further and allowed him to believe that he could sail from, from Spain uh, to, to Cathay, to, if you like, to China, Japan or India in literally a matter of weeks, not understanding that uh, there was some 12,000 miles of sea between uh, Spain and uh, the, the Far East. And of course, the American continent in, in the way as well. So um, these um, uh, academics like Ptolemy and Marinus of Tyre actually made fairly fundamental errors. Um, but nonetheless, um, if we look at the evidence of Strabo, who was a geographer, he says that the Phoenicians were um, uh, well uh, uh, had you know strong influence down the eastern um, Atlantic seaboard. He said, in fact, he says they had some 300 settlements down the eastern uh, seaboard. Now, if I show you that on this next slide, um, that would be all the way down from Portugal and Spain right the way down to Morocco, and even if we assume that that's something of an exaggeration, there's no doubt about it that the Phoenicians uh, were in a, a strong position to sail into the Atlantic. And if we allow for the fact that uh, um, there was this uh, misunderstanding of the size of the world, uh, some of these uh, writings that have been found illustrate that uh, the ancients talked about um, some islands 40 days sailing from, uh, from the Canary Islands, as, it, as they called them, the Fortunate Islands. And we've got uh, academics um, like uh, Solanus uh, and uh, Siversen who were, were saying that beyond um, beyond the Fortune Islands, the, the, the Hesperides Islands, that as I mentioned, were some 40 days sailing uh, to the west. So there are, if you like, glimpses of knowledge uh, that the ancients knew about islands way beyond the, the Fortune Islands. And if I just um, add one more piece to the puzzle, here you can see um, a gold satyr from Carthage with the Carthaginian horse on it. And um, Professor uh, Mark McMenamin, uh, in the, writing in the 1990s, uh, de he describes in some of his papers that beneath this horse, 
is what appears to him as the map of the world with America and Asia uh, in it. And I wrote to him a couple of months ago and said, well, you know, time has gone by. It's 20 odd years since you published your thesis. Do you still stand by the thesis that this, uh, this little image that is at the bottom of these coins represents the, the new world? And, and he's a, um, a very credible um, uh, academic. And he said, yes, he said, I do, because uh, of all the available evidence, it's the best fit that we have to explain what is going on here. And, um, and I was quite taken in by the fact that even after 20, 25 years of this uh, revelation that he made, that he thought this is here, if you like, is another glimpse of evidence that uh, the ancients knew that there was more to the world than you know Europe and, and Central Asia. So I've in included it here. There are, of course, many um, rock carvings and the like all over both North America, Central America, and, and some in, in South America. But I tend to think that most of those um, are always sort of disputed and it's not hard enough evidence uh, to be conclusive uh, in, in this thing. But I think there's enough uh, evidence and sort of pieces of information which give us a clue that the ancients knew um, at least something about the new world. But you may be asking, well, surely there would be much more evidence than, than what I've just talked about. And I just want to um, explain why there isn't more evidence, or at least put forward a theory why there isn't more evidence. Imagine if right now all of the hard disks um, that we have in the world that are storing all of our data and allowing us to do like this presentation now was suddenly not available. Uh, we would simply go back in terms of knowledge and time not quite into the dark ages, but we would be profoundly limited in terms of our knowledge. And in the ancient world, that is exactly what happened. And that, uh, if I can just show you now, um, we had two of the greatest destructions of knowledge ever known to mankind. First of all, the, um, the destruction in the second century of the library at Alexandria, where there was some 40,000 scrolls, some 150 librarians, that was destroyed. So a huge amount of the world's knowledge was destroyed. And if that wasn't enough, um, before that, um, at Carthage, when uh, the Romans sacked Carthage after the Third Punic War in um, in 146 AD, uh, Carthage was literally you know, destroyed to the ground and the ancient library in Carthage was destroyed. So all the knowledge that the Carthaginians had, or most of it, not all of it, but most of it uh, was destroyed. So knowledge of these lands um, is perhaps not surprising that we don't know more about it because of these, the destruction of these two libraries. We do, however, know that uh, the Carthaginians sent two admirals into the Atlantic, um, Himlico and um, Haino, Admiral Haino. One sailed north, the other uh, sailing south, respectively. And uh, indeed, the Carthaginians are the first recorded sailors in the Atlantic in the ancient times. So, but the reason we probably don't know more is because of the destruction of both Carthage and uh, the, uh, the library at Alexandria. So I think that helps to explain why we don't know more. But as I've said, there are glimpses that the ancients knew uh, about these islands and lands across the other side of the Atlantic. So I now come to the sort of 
the, the third part of my presentation, and that is um, our expedition to show that the Phoenicians could have made such voyages without too much difficulty. Um, it took us several years to, to get the boat ready uh, and, the, and the supplies and, and support necessary to launch the expedition. But we managed to get the boat to uh, modern day Carthage to, in Tunisia by September 2019. And you can see here we are preparing the sails and, and getting the boat ready. We were received incredibly well by the Tunisian authorities who were delighted that we wanted to recognize Carthage as you know, the, the most important uh, Venetian uh, city-state, if you like, in the Western Mediterranean, and that we were gonna start our expedition from there. And uh, the authorities there and the, the locals uh, were incredibly generous in, in supporting us. And here's some of the, you know, the supplies and goods that turned up one day on the boat for us to uh, store away for our um, our voyage. We left uh, Carthage um, and the Bay of uh, Tunisia on the 28th of September 2019 uh, in, in, in quite a gale and um, it, I think it's fair to say that we had the worst weather actually in the Mediterranean than we did going across the Atlantic. Um, although people think that the Mediterranean is all sun and blue seas and, and, and all nice sailing, um, because the Mediterranean is relatively shallow, you get some pretty difficult um, conditions uh, in, in terms of wave height and strength. So it's, it's not an easy um, place to sail all of the time. Um, and after literally the first four or five days of sailing, um, one of my colleagues got extremely concerned that the mast was gonna break. And um, I knew it was fairly sort of questionable, although I sort of thought it would probably be okay. But what we did just to be safe rather than sorry, we cut about six feet off the top of the mast and so that we could um, secure the yard uh, much lower down to a thicker piece of 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 the actual mast um, because the mast at that point was uh, quite th or relatively quite thin so this actually meant to uh, going into algeria which was not um, our plan at all but we spent a couple of days in algeria in the port um, sorting out the mast and then we came out and we then sailed on to um, to gibraltar and Cadiz uh, before heading south and going down to uh, to Morocco. And um, you know the the conditions were quite challenging. When we were sailing down to Morocco, we had quite a strong northerly wind, and we had to basically uh, avoid many many little fishing vessels that even you know. We were sailing eight or nine miles off the coast. There were still lots of little fishing boats out there, which with a sailing boat and a, and a fresh wind that we had, that was quite, quite challenging to do. And when we got down to Mogador or uh, Mogador Island, which is the island that's just uh, at the, um, the mouth of the Mogador Bay and Essaouira, um, we had a really difficult time navigating and, and negotiating in the middle of the night getting into the the uh, the bay area and and uh, near to the port so it's quite a tricky um sail down the the coast but um mogador was one of the largest um phoenician settlements on the moroccan coast and there was undoubtedly trading of iron and metals there as well as fish and and other goods so the um, the locals who we met in uh, Morocco and Essaouira were delighted that we had decided to visit uh, Mogador and Essaouira before we set out properly across uh, the Atlantic. And when we were there, um, we were cooped up 
in in the port um, the weather outside was very rough and all the fishing boats were 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 in the port um, because they weren't allowed out uh, because the weather was so rough outside but um, this is uh, Phoenicia alongside in, in the harbour in um, in uh, Essaouira and uh, this is a close-up of the fishing boats um, I can tell you the the smell of the fishing boats will, will be with me forever it was quite an incredible experience I mean great cultural experience um, and, a, and a wonderful place to go but uh, goodness the smell was uh, quite uh, overcoming should we say so we then um, left Essaouira and uh, Morocco and sailed across to the Canary Islands as our sort of the last stop. And uh, we reached um, Tenerife and then we sailed on from Tenerife, having done some repairs in, in Tenerife. And there was a historic reason for calling into the Canary Islands. It is now, I think, proven beyond doubt that the Phoenicians traded there. Uh, archaeologists have found what they believe is a, is a Phoenician sort of warehouse for trading on one of the islands. And indeed, some of the uh, sort of indigenous uh, languages uh, link back to some of the Phoenician um, languages. So um, in our view, undoubtedly, the Phoenicians did know about um, the Canary Islands. And uh, this this picture here is, is one of our crew members sort of pointing out that uh, there is a falcon here that's just landed on the on the boat and has, has been flying around. And uh, this falcon became a bit of a favourite with the crew, even though we were three or four hundred miles offshore. This falcon seemed to have lost its way um, and very sadly after befriending us and we put out a bit of food for it uh, one day it flew off and dived in the water after a fish and sadly we never saw it uh, after that so um, it probably met a, a watery end but uh, whilst he was with us um, it was quite quite something um, Obviously, during the voyage, we were constantly tightening, you know, our, our ropes and sails. Uh, there were always repairs to be made, um, and we were working you know, obviously 24/7. With uh, we had 12 people on board, and uh, usually at any one time we had one watch of about four people, um, you know, steering the boat and making sure that uh, our sails were uh, as tight as they could be so we could pick up as much wind as, as possible. So here are a couple of guys just adjusting the sail. Um, but we also had an unexpected visitor on our boat. This uh, visitor had been picked up in Tenerife. And to begin with, we thought this visitor was just a mouse. Um, because we started noticing that some of our fresh food or apples had been gnawed away at. And then we found bags of raisins and dried fruit had been uh, eaten away at. And uh, we soon realized that this wasn't a mouse, but it was actually a rat. And um, here you can, we, we, we searched our heads for how we could possibly catch this rat and uh, get rid of it. It was a, a huge worry, both from a sort of health and safety point of view, from a disease point of view. And with this rat running around um, the boat, you know, one night, one of the crew actually saw it on the deck. And uh, interestingly, whilst some people had been sleeping on the deck on the floor, all of a sudden, um, the crew members wanted to uh, secure bunks and, and, and hammocks rather, so that uh, they wouldn't get the, the rat uh, crawling over them. So it was a bit of a worry. And uh, Yuri, our film cameraman and uh, director, he created a trap for the rat. Um, to begin with, the rat was too clever and managed to get in, get the food and get out without the, 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 the door coming down. But eventually we caught the rat 
and then there was a, a bit of a discussion as to what we should do with the rat but every most most members of the crew just wanted to get rid of it so we threw the this contraption overboard with a rope and um let it drown and then we brought the, the box back on board so uh, we got rid of the rat and a huge jubilation and relief that we didn't have this rat on board anymore so that was the story of, of the rat it uh, took about two weeks for us to catch it and get rid of it but um, by that time we were well over halfway across the Atlantic um, and we as you can see here celebrated Christmas at sea and uh, on the 31st of December in the morning, um, we reached the Dominican Republic. We had sailed all the way from, from Tenerife, a relatively straightforward sail for, you know, most sort of experienced sailors, but we had a, a sort of a mixed crew, some who had never really sailed much before, uh, but four or five of us had obviously done quite a lot of sailing. So um, it was all, in all, let's say, relatively easy which to me shows that yes the Phoenicians could have easily made it across the Atlantic and um, at short notice the Dominican Republic Navy um, agreed to welcome us they were delighted that we had made landfall in the Dominican Republic and um, we came alongside some of their ships in uh, Santo Domingo and they welcomed us and they were incredibly hospitable to us. And of course, it also, by coincidence, fitted in with the fact that Columbus had uh, made uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic pretty much the center of his uh, colonial occupation. And there are some interesting parallels to be made there. But we spent three weeks there before then, um, heading up towards uh, Florida and uh, making landfall in, in, in uh, North America as such. And that journey up to Florida at times is very difficult. At one point, the horse's head that you can see here um, on the, the front of the vessel, which was the, the hippoi as a, a symbol of Phoenician, um, uh, yes, one of the sort of Phoenician symbols that were used on these types of ships, that Phoenician horse's head at one point went completely underwater. The, the waves are so big as we were heading up towards Florida. But after about 12 days, we managed to reach Florida and we were sort of overcome by the complete contrast between the Dominican Republic and the fact that we had really been you know, living hand to mouth for the last, uh, you know, six or seven weeks. And uh, I'll just show you the contrast. We got into the sort of the, the waterways in Florida, nothing but huge mansions, these uh, sports um, fishing boats, and any number of, um, any number of super yachts with helicopters on and you, you just couldn't believe your eyes. I mean, I had never seen anything like such wealth uh, before in my life, but we were welcomed uh, royally by the, um, um, the Coral Ridge Yacht Club in um, Fort Lauderdale. And they really did um, roll out the red carpet for us. And, um, you know, it was a, a fitting end to this voyage of uh, some 6,000 miles that had taken us, you know, the best part of five months to complete. And when we were um, at the Coral Ridge Yacht Club in Fort Lauderdale, um, there were various speakers, and one of them was um, uh, an Indigenous uh, lady called Betty Red Ant from the uh, the Navajo Nation, and that's the American Indian tribe that lives in the sort of Colorado uh, River area uh, near Austin. Um, uh, sorry, not Austin, um, uh, near Phoenix, I should say. And she told a story about what the uh, the Navajo Nation believe, and that is that the they believe their ancestors came 
across the Great Sea from the east. In other words, they came across the Great Sea uh, of the Atlantic Ocean to come to the Americas. And when she told this story and you know how she was celebrating our arrival, I was reminded of the Norse sagas, which told of the Vikings reaching a land beyond Greenland. And for many uh, centuries, uh, nobody believed that uh, the Vikings had actually reached uh, North America uh, until the 1960s when the, the settlement in Labrador was, was found. And interestingly, just in the last couple of weeks, they've now been able to pinpoint the exact date that um, the Vikings arrived in, in Labrador um, at Axel Meadows. And that's been defined as uh, 1021 AD is for when they were, were using that settlement. And so it just shows you how far science has come. And I believe that, uh, you know, in the, in the decades ahead, as science, get better, as science gets better and there's more DNA evidence and the like, eventually we will be able to show that the Phoenicians beat both the Vikings and Columbus uh, to the Americas. So on that point, I'd like to finish my part of the presentation, but very happy to answer any questions you may have. Brilliant. Thank you, Philip. Look at you. You bang on time. That's incredible. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, really great presentation. We will take some questions from the audience. If you haven't posted a question to us yet, then do so. Um, and we shall put them to um, Philip. We do have a question from uh, Robert or Bob. Um, what did you use for ballast and how much was required? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we used um, good old steel plate. Um, it would have been nice to use sort of lead ingots or the like, and they might have used um, sort of uh, you know, possibly um, stone anchors and things like that. But we actually used steel plate partly because it was available and relatively easy to put on the the, the, the ribs, the floor ribs. And um, believe it or not, uh, we put 20 tons in so the the um the, the tonnage of the boat was was estimated at 50 tons at, at which of which there was you know the the ballast we had uh, 20 tons in it so it's uh yeah. there was substantial it wasn't um going to capsize easily that's yeah uh, yeah well I mean, why why search for lead ingots at 20 tons if you've got readily available supply of uh, of steel that's a that's a lot of weight isn't it incredible um in terms of the um the wood i mean i'd only really heard of um isn't it um the um uh, the aleppo pine isn't the resin used in some sort of flavoring of a drink is it greek is it retsina or something um i think if i remember rightly um from my uh, from my greek holidays um is it was it presumably it's readily available in in forests near to the boat boatyard it wasn't yes, have to be, it didn't it, have to be brought in no all of the timbers we were able to get from syria um but we did suffer shortages of the oak uh timber the mediterranean oak which is a sort of a, a shorter oak than um the sort of oak that we're used to in in, in europe and uh, we use walnut, which was used in the ancient times. But where, I mean, have we built the boat in the Lebanon? Getting hold of Lebanese cedar is 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 very restricted, and you need special permission. I mean, we, in fact, we needed special permission anyway to get some of these timbers. But um, as I say, the um, the forestry or the sawmills uh, did actually run out of some of the timbers we wanted, but we were able to replace it with other ones that were available in the you know the ancient times and presumably with a with a boat builders using modern tools it wasn't a kind of let's um you know character let's get into this and let's use um uh ancient, ancient tools yeah that's right so uh we would have yeah saved a lot of time so we weren't using the ads and uh, things like that so um you know the the, the planks were were cut using sort of modern uh, saw benches and and uh, in some cases chainsaws to to do it because 
I think uh, it would have probably taken two or three years to if it if we'd done it by hand rather than using power tools. But the you know the shapes and the accuracy was all there. But uh, yeah, we um, we certainly did use modern equipment, and we did a little bit of steaming of some of the beams as well to get the the necessary curvature. Sometimes out of the forest they managed to get the ribs that were already naturally shaped but sometimes some of the planks we need we had to steam them a little bit to get the, them to to bend uh, how we wanted them to because the because the time frame was seven to eight months to build that's pretty quick so um uh yes it, you, have you been following how long it's taking them to build the saxon who uh, sorry the sutton who um ship when they're doing it all by hands like god oh, it's going to take a long time yes that's right it's um definitely going to yeah, take a long time uh nick's asked a question nick wonders what navigation techniques did the phoenicians employ and i wonder what navigation techniques you employed yeah so that's a good question so um the phoenicians had a range of tools i mean the the biggest thing or one of the things which i'm glad you asked the question is um you know the phoenicians discovered the pole star so and that constellation is known as the phoenix which is you know the, the greeks named after the phoenicians um and so the discovery of the pole star meant that um basically wherever you see that pole star you can calculate an approximate latitude so i remember when we sailed up uh, originally on the, around Africa, uh, as we were coming up from the southern Atlantic and past the equator, all of a sudden, you know, the you would see the, the pole star on the horizon. So it would tell you where sort of, you know, due north was, but you could also, by seeing how far above, you know, what the angle was, um, give, gives, would give you your approximate latitude. And then, of course, with the sun, you effectively have got east and west. So um, the stars were important to, to the Phoenicians. And then they probably had some other um, ideas as well. I mean, one of the sort of stories about the Phoenicians is they used to take doves with them. And when they weren't sure of the direction, they would let a dove out and see which way it, it flew. And then they would determined that that was the way that that was the nearest way to land so um it is a yeah, interesting um thing but certainly navigation and being able to i mean they were the first sailors to sail at night and um that was one of the uh, observations that their you know sworn enemies the greeks made that uh, the phoenicians were um you know able to sail at night uh, and, and more confident than other sailors and what about um, you folks were you were you using well, gps or do you use this pole star and and the sun as well and the doves did you let any doves off <laughs> we didn't let any doves off we didn't have any um animals apart from the rat and a few few other little creepy crawlies and things um but we used gps but we actually did have two or three crew members who were really interested in the stars and making observations and the like but um i'm not going to pretend that we you know did an exercise in astro navigation or anything but uh, we were certainly you know well aware of the constellations and the stars and things brilliant um we've got a question from uh pa pavel uh what was the technical condition of the ship after the voyage were you able to return to tunis by sea i mean where is the, where is it now um well that's a good question um a very good question and, and potentially a bit of a sore point too um <laughs> so what happened was um you know our timing was both good and bad um we arrived in fort lauderdale at the beginning of february um 2020 we were invited down to miami to sort of celebrate what we'd done and everything so we took the boat down to miami which is only 20 30 miles down the coast and uh, then came back and found a berth for phoenicia but then uh, obviously what was happening around the world was covid was closing in and um 
the, the advice was, um, you know, my colleagues and friends in the UK were saying, for goodness sake, Philip, get out of the US because if you're not careful, you might be stuck there for the next six months or so. You just don't know what's going to happen. Get, get, get home. So I found a berth for Phoenicia and thinking that, you know, a few months later I would return and then we would make a plan to bring Phoenicia back or do something with her or find a, a longer term home for her. But when September came, I was in no particular mood to go to America, given the state of COVID there and no vaccines at that point. And then when I came to want to go back uh, to the States in March, April time, um, there was a travel restriction and I couldn't do it easily. But eventually by May this year, um, I was able to find a way to get into the States. Um, which was by spending two weeks in Bermuda, um, which sounds glamorous, but it wasn't. Um, <laughs> so that I was, a, you know, I had to be out of the UK and Europe for two weeks before I could get in there. Um, and I then spent three months uh, trying to find a place for Phoenicia. But the problem was that over the last, the previous 18 months, she her, her uh woodwork had really deteriorated and she was in no fit state to make a return voyage and i couldn't i approached many american university or uh, sorry um museums none of them had space for her so i took a decision about two months ago that we would take her apart and put her into two containers um and ship her back to the UK. And then she can be rebuilt somewhere uh, or shipped uh, to a potential museum or uh, amusement, or, well, some kind of um, attraction that is interested in having um, a, a Phoenician ship or the skeleton of, an, of a Phoenician ship, uh, you know, to display and the like. So, um, she was actually meant to be shipped down to Miami yesterday, but they sent the wrong truck. But um, oh. anyway, so she is due to come back um, in the next couple of months, admittedly in two very large containers. And then one day she will um, be put together again and hopefully end up being displayed in some museum or, as I say, visitor attraction where people are interested in either the Phoenician culture or history, that kind of thing. Yeah. Because in Turkey, didn't they sink a, a replica ship that they built and try to understand how it dissolved or degraded on the seabed? Uh, they did make, I know they made a replica of the Ulubarun uh, ship, but nearly accidentally sunk it but i don't know whether they <laughs> did whether whether there was an a del i mean then they raised it again after they sank it on the maiden voyage they sank it but i don't know whether there was a deliberate attempt to um i need to rack my I need to rack my brain this was like a decade ago now or so um someone's asked timothy's asked about did you have a support boat when you went across the atlantic or were you on your own uh, no we were on our own um yeah, all of the sort of voyages I've done, I've never really believed in having a support boat. So, um, yeah, we were on our own. And um, I sort of always think, you know, we have four four chances. You know, if the if the boat starts to sink, we can call for a, we always call for a, you know, a container ship to come and pick us up. And if there's not a container ship there's a life raft and if the life rafts don't work you've got a life jacket and if the life jacket doesn't work you can swim so um i've never really believed in um in you know having a support vessel and of course it'd be hugely expensive so we we did it uh, on our todd uh, robert has asked a question were you aware of pollution as with the ra expeditions um i'm not quite sure uh the reference the ra but i am very conscious of the pollution in certain parts of the mediterranean 
And so we did do a project. We took two water samples every day from Tunisia through the Mediterranean and through the Atlantic to Florida. And um, so we have all these samples of uh, water and they're about to be analyzed by a university in, in Brazil, um, but it's been really quite delayed by, uh, the results been delayed because of COVID and the laboratory um, not being, uh, students not being able to work on it because of COVID, uh, they're still not allowed back into this particular university in Brazil that's gonna do this work. So it's slightly unfortunate, but we're hoping that they'll you know, be able to get to grips with it quite soon. But we've still got all these water samples and it will be very interesting to to look at the percentage pollution as you know across both the western mediterranean and the atlantic okay thank you um yeah robert's gone on to say yes it was thor heiderdahl saw apparently lots of pollution when was crossing the atlantic with these sort of swirling land masses of, of, of rubbish that um, find their way into the atlantic um, some people seem to think we should sink it at Stony Cove or maybe actually have it on display in Fort Cumberland. I'm not sure our uh, landlords would be uh, necessarily so keen to, <laughs> to, put it on, uh, to put it on display. Uh, right, let's see if we've got anyone else. Anything else from anybody? Going once. Anything else? Going twice. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That's brilliant, Phil. I think we've um, uh, our audience has um, has asked their questions. Thank you so much for your contribution. Um, uh, I hope you thought the technology worked okay. Yeah, no, it seemed to work very well. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, folks. Well, I've just got to find my uh, screen sharing ability to um, show next month's presentation. Let me just see if I can do this in a swift and decisive manner. Let's have a look. Do just bear with me, everybody. Takes me a little. Duh, here we go. Hopefully, people can see that. Okay, so where's my notes? Here we go. So thanks to Philip uh, and to everybody for attending today's webinar and for um, participating through submitting your questions. We will be recording. Um, uh, Philip's kindly given us permission to record today's presentation. So the recording will be placed on our YouTube channel in due course, uh, where we'll also put links to resources that Philip's given us in terms of the website address that he's provided um, uh, to us. I think, oh, you didn't mention your book, Philip. There's a book coming out soon, isn't there? Come on, there you didn't take the opportunity for a no. sales pitch. I didn't. So uh, yeah, no, um, I'm really quite optimistic. So yeah, some of the things I've talked about to, to this evening, um, including, you know the historical references and uh, and evidence uh, for the the ancients knowing about the you know the new world. Uh, it's going to be in the book called Atlantic BC. You know the epic recreation of a Phoenician voyage two thousand years before Columbus. And um, I'm hoping to get it out by the end of November in time for Christmas. So you can either order it on the PhoeniciansBeforeColumbus.com website or it'll be on Amazon. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll have the whole story there. So uh, yeah, do um, do send us an email if you're interested. That would be, yeah. be great. Shame not to have the opportunity to, to plug the, the upcoming book. Uh, and the website address is uh, PhoeniciansBeforeColumbus.com and we'll put a link to it in the YouTube video as well when we post that online. Um, so you're on the YouTube channel, you'll also find recordings of the other presentations that we've done as part of this series going all the way back to January, seems like a long time ago now, uh, as well as the other talks that have been recorded from the IGNA series and the COVID talks that we did in 2020. So uh, next month we shall be hearing from Hunter Whitehead, project manager and principal investigator from Marine Archaeology Division of Coastal Environments Inc. Uh, in the USA who's going to be talking to us about aviation heritage underwater, archaeological site formation processes and other considerations when dealing with uh, planes that have downed uh, in water. So that's on the 24th of November. 
uh, at 1900 hours GMT because of course the clocks will have changed. So on behalf of the NES and behalf of our sponsors, uh, the Honor Frost Foundation, thanks once again to Philip and thank you all for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you.